morning, everybody. Welcome to tonight's webinar. I'll be talking about injuries of the hip and knee. So just a little bit about me. So my name is Dr. Christina Kane. I'm a Springfield native. I did most of my training at, in Worcester um, at the University of Massachusetts, where I did my medical school and orthopedic surgery residency training. And then I did a year-long fellowship in sports medicine um, at New England Hospital, New England Baptist Hospital in Boston. And my main focus is arthroscopic surgery of the shoulder, hip, and knee. And then I also have a special interest in open shoulder surgery and shoulder replacements. So today I'll cover some common conditions of the hip and knee that I see frequently in clinic. Of course, the hip and knee are complicated joints. So, and there's many injuries that we can't you know, completely cover today. So I picked three common injuries for both the hip and the knee um, that I see often, and we'll go over those. Um, so first we'll start off with some anatomy of the hip. We'll quickly go over labral tears of the hip, some uh, information about hip impingement and then trochanteric bursitis. And then we'll get into knee anatomy, meniscus tears, ACL tears, and patellofemoral syndrome. So first we'll have some poll questions throughout the webinar. Here is our first poll question. Do you currently have hip and or knee pain? And I'll give you just like a minute or so to answer. So Maggie, just let me know when there, when it pops up, because I can't see it. Okay, so we have some answers. So, so wow, so 40% of you say that you have both hip and knee pain, about 13% only hip, one third of you have knee pain, and then 13% of you have neither. So that's good for you guys. So, okay, let's, let's go on. All right, so let's start some basic anatomy of the hip joint. So the hip joint is a deep ball and socket joint made up of the head of the femur, which is the ball part of the joint, and the acetabulum or the socket part of the joint. The acetabulum is a cup-like structure and it's part of the, the whole pelvis. So the hip joint is surrounded by over 17 muscles that allow six basic hip movements. So if you look at this diagram here, so you can flex your hip, you can extend it, and then there's abduction and adduction. So bring your leg away from you and then toward your body and then internal and external rotation. So let's talk about the hip labrum. So it's a, the labrum is a Latin word that means lip. The hip labrum is a horseshoe shaped structure of thick cartilage that surrounds the cup part of the hip or the acetabulum. So here you can see that thick fiber cartilage surrounding the, the cup part of the hip. The function of the labrum, it's much like a gasket that seals uh, the joints between two pipes. So, you know, so this gasket down here seals the two pipes so that there's not any leakage and there's a good suction seal. The labrum is very much like that. So the labrum's primary function is to improve stability of the hip by creating a suction seal between the acetabulum or the cup part of the hip and the femoral head or the ball part. So let's quickly talk about labral tears. So tears of the labrum can be seen in all age groups of patients. I see them quite frequently. So, and there's approximately one third of the population in general has a labral tear, whether or not they know they have it or they're symptomatic, they may or may not be. Risk factors for having a labral tear, acetabular dysplasia. So hip dysplasia is when the hip socket or the cup part of the hip doesn't fully cover, cover the femoral head. Other risk factors include trauma. So if you had a hip dislocation or a, a subluxation, which is a minor, not a full dislocation, but a little bit of movement there. Hyperlaxity, so patients who have loose joints are more susceptible to a labral tear. Patients who have arthritis in their joint most likely have a labral tear. And then patients who have impingement of their hip. So what are the symptoms that you may have if you have a labral tear? So common symptoms include pain in the groin. Um, there's also 
what we describe as C-type uh, pain. So you may have pain that starts in the groin and then radiates to the lateral side of your hip. Patients may also complain of snapping that they hear or feel in their hip or sensation of the hip joint kind of catching or locking, and then you have to get up and move it to kind of get it to free up, free up. How do we diagnose the labral tear? So your, your doctor may try and kind of recreate that groin pain on physical exam. There's some provocative maneuvers you can do to kind of try and pitch, pinch the labrum. We always typically get x-rays. Typically they're normal, but you want to, x-rays are kind of a way to rule out other things going on in the hip. So x-rays only show us bony anatomy. You can't see a labral tear on x-rays, but it's a way to rule out other diagnoses such as hip dysplasia or hip arthritis. Ultimately, if your doctor is concerned about you having a labral tear, they may get an MRI or an MRI arthrogram. Arthrogram just means that they inject dye into the hip during the MRI. And that is very sensitive for diagnosing a labral tear. And then sometimes your, your doctor may suggest that you try a diagnostic hip injection where they put some anesthetic into the hip like a Novocaine or a lidocaine. And then they go ahead and try and recreate that pain on exam and that will help them kind of determine if you may benefit from surgery or not. So if you look here, so here is an AP pelvis an X-ray. So you can see the pelvis, you can see your femurs, and then these are the hip joints. So this is a normal AP pelvis with nice, nice joint spaces here on both sides. So here's an example of hip dysplasia. So here you can see the pelvis, and then you can see this femoral head over here the cup part isn't as deep as this one. And this is an example of hip dysplasia. So, so the femoral head or the ball part does not have a deep enough cup. So it's under, it's under covered. And then lastly, here's an example of hip arthritis. So here you can see, so this hip on, on this side, you can see a nice joint space here between the cup and the ball part of the hip joint. And here you can see that that space is completely obliterated. This patient has bone on bone arthritis here. All right, moving on. So what is the treatment for hip labral tears? Typically, we start off with non-operative treatment. Um, initial treatment may include things like NSAIDs. Uh, physical therapy is usually first line treatment as well. And then plus or minus a steroid injection. So usually I avoid steroid injections in my younger patients because we know that multiple steroid injections over time can degrade some of the soft tissue structures. So I, I usually try to avoid that in my younger patients. Um, but typically this is kind of the first line um, defense for labral tears. So when is surgery indicated? So surgery is indicated for patients who fail conservative treatment or younger patients. Typically we may go straight to surgery in a younger patient if they have a, a big labral tear. Um, and what do you do for surgery? How do you treat a labral tear? So usually the, the treatment is a hip scope or hip arthroscopy, where you go in minimally invasive, poke holes around the hip. And then if you get in there and the labral tear is poor quality, it cannot hold a suture, um, then you would debride it and clean it up. Um, if the labral tear is very good quality, then you can try and repair it for the patient. So here's an example of a labral tear hair. And then here you can see sutures holding together that labral tear and um, you know, restoring its anatomy. So let's get uh, into hip impingement now. So hip impingement is also known as femoral acetabular impingement, which is a, a mouthful. We call this FAI for short. So if you say hip impingement, people will know what you're talking about. So hip impingement is a condition where the femoral head pinches against the acetabulum or the cup of the hip and then this pinching can cause damage to the cartilage as well as the labrum of the hip. Um, and in very extreme cases, as it progresses, you can get arthritis from the extent of cartilage wear. There are two main types of hip impingement. The first is called a pincer deformity. That is where you have extra bone on the cup of the hip. And the other is called a cam deformity, which is where you have extra bone on the, the ball part or the neck of the femur. So again, so the femoral head would pinch against the, the acetabulum. And from that, you can get a labral tear, you can get labral injury and cartilage injury. And then as it progresses, you can um, get arthritis in severe cases. 
So both these deformities, both the CAM and the pincer, are deformities commonly seen in the general population. More commonly, the CAM is present in young athletic males, while the pincer is more common in active middle-aged women. And then there are patients who have combined. So they have both a CAM, extra bone on the femur, and a pincer, extra bone on the, the cup part of the, the acetabulum. Some people have hip impingement. They have these deformities and they don't even know it because they're completely asymptomatic. They don't have any pain. Um, but some people do have pain from that. People who are more susceptible to developing pain from hip impingement are people who participate in activities with extreme range of motion of the hips. So if you think about ballet dancers, gymnastics, martial artists, so they, you know, they are going to extremes of range of motion with their hip joint. So they're more susceptible to these extra bony deformities banging up into the labrum and cartilage of the hip. So what are the symptoms of hip impingement? So oftentimes patients will complain of activity related groin pain with extreme hip flexion. They also will complain of clicking or popping or that kind of locking sensation we talked about with the labral tears. How do we diagnose these? We always start with x-rays. Um, and so here you can see an x-ray of a, a hip. You can see a large cam deformity. So this extra bump on this femoral head, um, which if you can imagine as this flexes up, will we'll pinch into the labrum, which is right here, which you can't see because it's an x-ray, but would pinch into the labrum and it would pinch into the cartilage of the acetabulum right there. Ultimately, if you're concerned your patient has hip impingement, you will get an MRI or MR arthrogram because you want to evaluate the labrum as well as the cartilage to make sure those aren't damaged from this bony deformity. So what is the treatment for hip impingement? So activity modifications, you can try to avoid these um, movements or deep flexion movements that cause groin pain. Um, we always kind of start patients in physical therapy, strengthen the muscles around the pelvis, um, as well as stretch them as well, can, which can kind of provide some pain relief. And then, you know, NSAIDs as well. So when is a hip scope warranted? So if a patient has a large cam or pincer deformity, if they fail non-operative treatment, they fail PT, they still have hip pain, then typically a hip scope is warranted. And oftentimes we, we kind of don't even do physical therapy. If we have a young athletic patient and they've been dealing with this for you know years, then we oftentimes go straight to surgery. And the, and the surgery to resolve this is what's called an osteoplasty. So you take, you basically want to shave down that extra bone to get a nice smooth surface. So that extra bone is not impinging on the labrum when you do these extreme motions. So here you can see a little bit of a bump on this side, small cam on this one, not, not nearly as big as the last one we saw. But now you, after an osteoplasty, after the surgeon has smoothed down that bump, you can see a nice contour to the femoral head. And you can imagine when this person now flexes up, there's not that extra piece of bone to pinch into the labrum there. If upon investigation of this, you're found to have arthritis in the hip, then typically a hip scope will not help. And at that point, we may be talking about a hip replacement, depending on how much arthritis is actually in the hip. All right, poll question number two. Do you currently have pain on the side of your hip? All right, just a more, couple more seconds to give you guys to answer. Maggie, do we have any results? All right, do you currently have pain on the side of your hip? So yeah, almost 40% of you do. So a lot of people. So this, this may or may not be relevant to this next topic. All right. So let's talk about trochanteric bursitis. So this is probably the most common type of hip pain I see in clinic. This is super common. Um, and lots of people suffer from pain on the side of their hip because of trochbursitis. So what is trochbursitis? So let's talk about 
what a bursa is first. So a bursa is a fluid filled sac near a joint. It's usually positioned between a bone and then a soft tissue structure such as a tendon and it acts to cushion or decrease friction between the tendon and the bone. So here you can see femoral head. This is the troch here, the greater choke of the femur. This little blob here is the bursa and then you have your IT band coming down. So this bursa is to protect the IT band from, the, from abrading against the bone. But the bursa can oftentimes get very inflamed and angry and can be very painful. So trochanteric bursitis is when this troch bursa gets irritated, inflamed, and causes pain, typically in the lateral side or right directly on the side, that hip bone that you can feel on the side, pain on that, right on the side of your hip right there over the greater troch. So as we said, symptoms are pain over the side of the hip. Oftentimes the pain can be worse at night, especially if you're lying on that hip. And then sometimes patients will complain of pain when going from a seated to a standing position. And then a lot of patients will complain that their pain is worse with prolonged walking, stairs, squatting. So what is the treatment for trochanteric bursitis? So again, activity modifications, specifically avoiding putting pressure or lying on that side of the hip. Um, we can try NSAIDs. Uh, physical therapy may or may not help. Typically, most patients end up getting a steroid injection if they fail these other conservative treatments, and that oftentimes can help. Um, the problem is it can provide temporary relief for months, um, if you're lucky, years, but um, sometimes they do help. I, more frequently, I've been doing some PRP injections, which is platelet-rich plasma um, injections in clinic. There's not much evidence for this. Insurance does not cover. It's a high out-of-pocket expense. So this is typically a last resort for me. Um, but some patients do get improvement with PRP. And then very rare refractory cases who people who just don't get better from any injections, therapy. Um, sometimes we'll, we will do surgery, make an incision, and take out that bursa. All right, so that ends our um, hip section, and now we're gonna get into some knee anatomy. So the knee joint has lots of structures that surround it. You can see from this pit, these pictures over here. The knee also bears a lot of force and stress through it, and everyday activities such as lifting, kneeling, running, a lot of stress is put through the knee with those activities. So let's just point out some important structures that kind of make up the knee joint. So the knee joint is made up of three bones. You have your femur or your thigh bone, your tibia or your shin bone, and then your patella, um, otherwise known as your kneecap. There are four primary ligaments that stabilize the knee joint. You have your collateral ligaments, so your LCL and your MCL. These are on the sides of your knee and they help resist side to side motion of your knee. Next, you have your cruciate ligaments, ACL and PCL. I'm sure most of you have heard of the ACL. These are on the, in the, inside the center of the knee, and they help prevent back and forth motion of your knee, as well as rotational stability to the knee joint. And then let's go over menisci. So you have two meniscus in each knee. You have a medial one and a lateral one. These are C-shaped shock absorbers of the knee. Um, so they're made of very elastic type of um, cartilage, and they're very important for preventing arthritis of the knee. Um, and as I said before, they are kind of like the shock absorbers of the knee. So they're absorbing a lot of force when you're doing these high impact activities. And I, I quickly want to just touch base on the meniscal blood supply, which is the blood supply to the meniscus itself, because this becomes very important when we get into the topic of meniscus tears, which I see a lot in clinic in all age groups. So the blood supply to the meniscus is very tenuous. The outer 25% to one third does have blood vessels that go to it to provide it nutrients. Um, but however, the, the inner 75% to 60% you know, of it has very, very little blood supply. There's no blood vessels getting in there. So when you don't have blood, it's very hard to promote healing in there. So this inner, you know, two thirds, 75% of the meniscus has a very limited healing ability. So that's why 
if you get a, a meniscus tear in this area of the meniscus, it really cannot heal on its own. Um, whereas tears that happen in the outer um, aspect of it, the outer 25% where there are, are those blood vessels coming in, they have a higher chance of being able to heal on their own without surgery or intervention. So whole question number three, have you ever had an ACL or a meniscus tear? All right, Maggie, what do we have? All right, so neither, 58% have, have not had neither a, a ACL or a meniscus. So that's, that's, that's great, that's actually really good. 12% um, have had both an ACL and a meniscus tear. And then a third of you have had a meniscus tear. And meniscus tears are pretty common, all right. Okay, so let's get into meniscal injury. So this is one of the most common soft tissue injuries of the knee and the most common reason that we do arthroscopic knee surgery. Um, there's two main types of lesions. So there is the traumatic meniscal tear. I often see this in young athletes sustained during a twisting injury to the knee. Um, and you are at a higher chance of having a, a, a traumatic lesion to your meniscus if you also tore your ACL if your ACL is deficient. And then very commonly as we age, the meniscus is not as robust and you're susceptible to degenerative tears. Um, and so we see this a lot in patients who have a little arthritis, a lot of arthritis. And this is very common in the, the medial horn of the medial meniscus as opposed to the lateral, but we do see them in both. So what symptoms may you be having if you have a meniscus injury? So typically you would have pain right over the front of the knee, right over the joint line, the medial joint line or the lateral joint line. And then you may also have locking or, or clicking or sensation of instability. If you have a meniscal tear, it's, it, it's usually not stable. So it can be flipping around in there to cause these kind of mechanical symptoms. And then a lot of times patients will complain of effusions swelling in the knee, it may fluctuate, come and go, um, and that's pretty common as well. So how do you diagnose a meniscus injury? The most sensitive physical exam finding is when your physician just pushes over your joint line. If you're tender there, I, I'm usually worried that you may have torn your meniscus. We always start with x-rays um, before doing anything else. Typically in younger patients, these are normal. So you can see this, this knee over here has nice joint spaces. Um, in a person with arthritis, you would see narrowing or maybe even bone on bone, but the most sensitive test by far is an MRI. So if I ever think I need to operate on somebody for a meniscus tear, I'm always getting an MRI to, to look to see if they do in fact have a meniscus tear. It, MRIs are not perfect, they're not hundred percent. So occasionally um, I end up scoping somebody because I have a high suspicion they have a meniscus tear, but the MRI missed it. This is, you know, rare, but it does happen. So what is the treatment for meniscus injury? Like every other orthopedic injury, first line treatment is non-operative. So in degenerative tears or tears are very small or incomplete, we'll, we'll start off with NSAIDs, therapy. Sometimes we'll try a cortisone injection and a lot of people will get better with this. Who ends up getting surgery for a meniscus injury? So if you have done your due diligence, you've, you've done you know six weeks of physical therapy and you continue to have pain, that may mean that you may need a knee scope. Um, tears that are more complex, uh, probably are not gonna do well with just non-operative treatment, so they may need a knee scope. And then degenerative tears with mechanical symptoms. So mechanical symptoms, buckling, instability, locking of the knee, these patients frequently end up getting um, a knee scope just because those mechanical symptoms can, Sometimes they won't get better with just therapy. You have to go in and actually trim out the meniscus for those the symptoms to improve. If you have a big bucket handle tear, which is, which is a big flap of the meniscus, that can flip in and out of the joint um, and can cause a locked knee. So that those are not getting therapy. Those are pretty much going straight to surgery. Tears of the meniscus root. So the root is where 
the meniscus attaches to the, the bone and it is its anchor. It's very important. If the root tears, the meniscus loses its ability to be a shock absorber from the knee. So it's pretty much not functional. So if I see a root tear and somebody who doesn't have much arthritis, they are going, they're pretty much going to surgery off the bat um, because we want to try and salvage that meniscus and repair the root. And then acute tears um, of the meniscus combined with an ACL tear, th those are usually getting surgery and tears in young athletes. I don't mess around with therapy with those. We wanna try to save the meniscus in young people because we know that if we don't, that they're a higher risk of arthritis. So those are typically always getting surgery. So tears that are not repairable or degenerative, what would be the surgical option for that? So you've done your therapy, your cortisone injection, you're not getting better. You have a, a degenerative tear. So at, at that point, I would recommend a knee scope and a partial meniscectomy. Those are fancy words for we go in there and we clean up the meniscus, get it back to stable border so it's not flipping around in a pain generator for you. So, so here on the right, you can see this tear in the posterior horn of the meniscus hair. And here's my shaver in there and I'm just smoothing it back to stable border so it's not flipping around and causing pain. So here's a 61 year old female. She had medial sided knee pain after twisting her knee on vacation, didn't get better with therapy, didn't get better with cortisone injections. So she ended up opting for a knee arthroscopy and she did very well after. I harp on this a lot. You always want to minimize the amount of meniscus you're taking out. So we have a lot of literature, a lot of data showing that if you take out a lot of the meniscus, then you're at a higher risk for developing arthritis. So whatever meniscus is stable, I always try and salvage and keep for the patient. So I'm taking out only the part that's damaged. Everything else I'm trying to leave for the patient to prevent early progression of arthritis. And if you just get a clean out, a partial meniscectomy, you're up and walking that day. I let you move it that day. We get you into PT and patients recover pretty quickly from this. Tears that are repairable. So these are tears that are in that outside part of the meniscus that we talked about, the peripheral zone where there's rich blood supply. So they have the ability to heal. So, so here's an example of, so this is a 45 year old male. So he was jumping into his pool. I think he was playing with his kids and he sustained this meniscus tear to his lateral meniscus. So here you can see this, this part here is a little degenerative. So I did have to clean that out. But then he also had a big cleavage tear in the posterior horn. So I clean it out, try to save what I can. And here you can see my sutures trying to restore the anatomy of the meniscus, save as much meniscus as I can for him because he really didn't have any arthritis and he did really well, this went on to heal. So save the meniscus, I can't harp on this enough. Try and keep as much healthy meniscus as possible for the patient, repair what you can, um, and then go from there. All right, let's get into my favorite topic, ACL tears. So ACL tears are pretty common athletic injury. We're getting into, you know, all our young kids are getting back to sports. So we're seeing quite a bit of these in, in clinic now that people are getting back to sports. So um, the majority of ACL injuries occur from a non-contact injury. So about 70% of these are non-contact. It's also known as a pivot shift injury. So the athlete typically tries to decelerate and then they abruptly change directions with a planted foot. Um, and that can cause an ACL tear. The other 30% are, are contact injuries, typically a blow from the outside part of the knee. And then what sports do we see these commonly in? So twisting, pivoting sports, most common sports that you see ACL tears. So soccer, basketball, skiing, football, all high risk for ACL injuries. Um, if you have an ACL injury, you're also at risk just from having the ACL of having a meniscus tear and about half of patients with an ACL tear will have a meniscus tear associated with that. And then there's a lot of data and literature. We know that if you have a chronic ACL tear, you don't get it reconstructed. You're at an increased risk for damage to your cartilage. You're at an increased risk that any meniscus tears are not repairable. Um, and then you're at an increased risk for development of early arthritis if you don't get your ACL reconstructed. What are risk factors for ACL tears? So being a female puts you at much higher risk. So females at a 4.5 times the risk of having an ACL from a pivoting sport than a male athlete. Um, 
if you're ligamentously lax, so if your joints are a little loose, that puts you at an increased risk for an ACL tear. Having poor jump landing mechanics puts you at extreme high risk of an ACL tear. So here you can see um, this athlete here is landing with great mechanics. So his knees are pushed out to the side. People who land like this, knock kneed, these are poor you know, landing mechanics, and this puts you at increased risk for an ACL tear. Then there is some data showing that the type of playing surface um, may increase your risk. So artificial turf and some sort of grass types that have higher friction associated with it um, may increase your risk for an ACL tear. So how, how do athletes or how do patients present if they have an ACL tear? So typically um, you will feel a pop or hear pop after a non-contact twisting injury. The pain will be deep in the knee. The majority of patients will get immediate swelling of the knee that day. The knee will blow up and it'll look twice the size of the other knee. That's very common. Uh, they may have difficulty walking on it after they tear their ACL. And then a lot of people complain of the sensation of knee instability. They feel like their knees buckling. They can't trust their knee. And that's, that's very common as well. How do we diagnose ACL tears? So your physician's always gonna start with a physical exam. They'll try and test your ACL by pulling on the tibia, see if there's increased translation of your tibia. But a lot of times when you know, the patients get very swollen, the athletes, get, they swell up right away, so it's hard to get a good exam. We always start with x-rays just to make sure there's no fractures. Up here, you can see this little bulge and fracture off the tibia. This is called a Sagan fracture, and this is a telltale sign for an associated ACL tear. All, any athlete I'm worried about an ACL tear, they're automatically getting an MRI, and these are highly sensitive, you know, 97% sensitive for ACL tear. So what's the treatment? So I hardly ever recommend non-operative treatment for an ACL tear in an athlete. Almost all of my athletes, a lot of my patients who are even active, middle age, if they're active, they're getting an ACL reconstruction. So the treatment you cannot, so the, the ACL is a ligament inside the knee and because of the surrounding fluid, it has poor ability to heal. So we don't repair the ligament, we reconstruct it with a graft. So the treatment is an ACL reconstruction. We do this through minimally invasive arthroscopic surgery. And all my younger and older active patients, if they tear their ACL, they're getting a reconstruction. There's two main types of grafts, allograft, which comes from a cadaver, and then autograft, which um, comes from your own body. So here you can see this is a normal ACL, um, this beautiful ACL right in the middle of the knee. Here's the PCL. This is what it would typically look like on a, a knee arthroscopy uh, in a healthy knee. Here is a torn ACL. You can see the probe in here pulling on this ACL remnant or stump. It's completely detached from the, the femur. And then here is a ham, this is an example of a hamstring autograft um, and it perfectly reconstructs the ACL. It looks beautiful. So when is it safe to return to sports after an ACL reconstruction? And this is a tough topic to talk to my athletes about because there's, in the sports world, we're looking at no sooner than nine months. And this is for NBA player, this is for NFL players. There's a lot of data showing that you, nine months to a year is about the time you're looking at after an ACL tear to get back to your pivoting sports. So all my athletes have to pass a ACL functional assessment test. So they do an in-depth test before they're allowed to return to sports with their therapist, which is a series of drills. They have to do squats, one leg squats to, to test their mechanics, to make sure that they're stable and strong enough to go back to sports. And then I do, I like to talk about this with my patients because there's a lot of psychological factors around returning to sport with after an ACL reconstruction. It's hard after your ACL is torn and then you go through a reconstruction. It, we find that athletes have a hard time trusting their knee. Um, and there's a lot of factors at play with this. And this can actually prolong the you know time frame of return to sport just because the athlete doesn't quite trust their knee. They need, they need a little bit more time to work on drills, um, practice to actually feel like they can trust their knee to pivot and twist and participate in these um, you know, high level twisting activities. So in terms of ACL injury prevention, 
We always want to focus on neuromuscular training and plyometrics. Proper jump mechanics is huge. It's so important. I can't harp on this enough. So here again, you, you see good mechanics. The knees are pushed out to the side. Here you see valgus, knock kneed. This is poor. This person is at extreme risk for an ACL injury or for tearing their graft if they're going back to sports doing a squat like this. You also want to focus on increasing your hamstring strength. And then a lot of people ask me, is bracing effective for ACL tears? And there's not much, uh, the data that shows us that it may be helpful in skiers, but not really helpful in many other pivoting activities or sports. So last poll question, do you have pain in the front of your knee? And by the front of your knee, I mean around your kneecap. All right, Maggie, what do we have? Yes, almost 50%. So yeah, that's a, that's a lot of people. Okay, so this, this topic is uh, maybe pertinent to you. All right, let's talk about patellofemoral pain syndrome. So this is a very common cause of pain in the front of the knee around the kneecap. I see this, this is probably one of the more common knee um, ailments I see in clinic. So patellofemoral pain syndrome is otherwise known as runner's knee or jumper's knee. Um, risk factors for it include physical activity that puts repetitive stress on the knee. So jogging, squatting, stairs. This can cause this runner's knee or pain around your kneecap. Also, if all of a sudden you start increasing your physical activity, you don't gradually you know, increase. All of a sudden you go from walking zero to walking four miles a day that may put you at increased risk of this patellofemoral pain syndrome. And then you're also at increased risk if you have malalignment of your kneecap. So abnormal tracking of your kneecap when you go from extension to flexion can put you at increased risk of this anterior knee pain, pain in the front around your kneecap. So what are symptoms of patellofemoral pain syndrome? So as we said, pain in the front of the knee or around the kneecap, otherwise known as the patella. Pain during exercise with frequent knee bending. So squatting, lunges, stairs, those kinds of things are going to cause pain in the front of the knee. Oftentimes, patient will describe that after they're sitting, so say if they sit down to watch a two-hour movie, they're sitting with their knees bent for two hours, and then they go up to, to stand. Then they complain of pain upon standing. That's called the theater sign, and that's a very common complaint with patellofemoral pain syndrome. And then I get this comment a lot in clinic. Patients complain of kind of crackling under their knee. Um, if there's pain associated with the popping or cracking, then yes, I'm worried about it. If there's no pain associated with it, then I'm not too worried about it. That's pretty common. But you can have popping and cracking with this patellofemoral pain syndrome. So what is the treatment for this? By far, the, the vast majority of patients improve with non-operative treatment. So how can this improve? So you want to, first of all, avoid high impact exercises uh, in favor of low impact act activities. So swimming is an excellent, excellent activity um, for you know, decreasing force on your joints. So this is really gonna help if you have anterior knee pain. Swimming is great. Elliptical is also great. That's low impact as well as stationary bike. Running high impact. So that may cause increased knee pain. So you, you have to avoid it forever just until your pain improves. And then we always talk about rice, resting, icing, um, compression and elevation, NSAIDs, and then weight loss may help with anterior knee pain as well. So always a healthy weight and diet. And then you really wanna focus on strengthening and stretching your quadriceps muscles, especially your VMO, which is the part of your quadriceps on the inside part of your leg. That is very important for helping the patella track central, and that can um, greatly help this anterior knee pain. Occasionally, if therapy, doesn't help, actually not occasionally. I, I do offer cortisone injections for patients with patellofemoral pain syndrome. I avoid it in my young patients at all costs, but in my older patients, um, cortisone injections can help significantly. And as I said before, surgically, surgical treatment for this is very rarely needed. Um, and if it is needed, it's a last line for me. And we would start off by doing a, a knee scope.
all right that's all i got for you guys i hope you enjoyed um thank you for coming and with that i'll take whatever questions you have all right so uh, bear with me because i have to i have to read them and then i'm going to read them back to you so you can know what we're um what we're going over Okay, so this first question, this patient has a lot of worn down cartilage in their knee and arthritic changes with fluid involved. Would I be a candidate for a cartilage replacement? And if so, does Medi Medicare cover it? How long does the surgery take and recover? So if you have a significant amount of arthritis, cartilage replacement is not gonna help. Uh, sorry, if you have a significant amount of arthritis, cartilage replacement is not gonna help. Cartilage replacement is really reserved for very focal, defects um, and patients with a otherwise healthy knee. So um, typically, if you have significant arthritis, you're looking probably, depending on the degree, if it's severe, you're looking at a knee replacement. Okay. I have a labral, so the next question, I have a labral tear for some time. My pain is getting worse over time. I'm 60 years old. Would I still be a candidate for, for arthroscopy? So you, yes, you may. So if, if you get x-rays and you have little to no arthritis, you have an intact joint and you don't have a lot of arthritis. Yes, I, I, I would. Yeah, it may be an option for you. I have scoped people. I've scoped 65 year olds with labral tears with very minimal arthritis. I will say there is a risk that when you get in there, that there's arthritis that x-rays and MRI didn't catch. So, um, but yeah, if your imaging looks good, you don't have a lot, you are, you could consider a uh, hip scope and labral repair. Yes. My orthodoc diagnosed hip bursitis, but my physical therapist diagnosed gluteal inflammation. What should I do? So, I think what I would do is probably a diagnostic injection. So an injection into the bursa, okay? Like we talked about before. If your pain gets better, then it's from bursitis. It's not from the gluteus muscles. If it doesn't, then you have to keep investigating and it might, might be the gluteal muscles. I was diagnosed with ischial bursitis. What is the best treatment for this? Ischial bursitis, yeah, that's a hard one because typically I would not, you know, do a cortisone injection in clinic for that. Um, if it is, in fact, the ischium or where the hamstring attaches, there are some people who may inject it under ultrasound. I, I have found it's, it's hard. I, I don't have anybody in the Berkshires yet who will do this. But I do know someone in Boston who who will if they're suspicious that it, it is in fact in, in fact the hamstrings attaching to the ischium, and around that that bursa there. Can you tell us about gel injections used for damaged cartilage of the knee? Okay, so there is a, an injection we call visco supplementation. It is a gelatinous gel-like material. So it mimics the synovial fluid, it's supposed to add a little cushion. And we use that commonly in patients. So typically we start with a cortisone injection. If that doesn't work, then we will go to these gel injections or visco supplementation. And it's typically for patients with arthritis and patients have pretty, sometimes depending on the degree of arthritis, they have pretty good outcomes with that. Next question, what does swelling and pain behind the knee indicate? So it could be a lot of things. Um, I would probably start out with some x-rays in clinic. If you have a lot of arthritis, it's most likely because of the arthritis. If not, then you, we may have to keep investigating and you may have to end up getting an MRI. But typically, um, if you have arthritis, the swelling and you can get fluid on the knee from arthritis.
So next question, I had a surgery to repair a torn quadriceps tendon. And as flexibility to knee returned, I developed severe pain in the hips and back. Is it more likely that it is a spine related or hip related? So there is this whole phenomenon of spine, uh, spine hip overlap. So it can be very hard to tell if, it's, if your pain's coming from the hip or if it's coming from the spine. So if that's the case, I would definitely see a, uh, an orthopedic surgeon, a doctor who can evaluate both your back and your hip. You may have to end up getting x-rays of one or the other, depending on what they think on physical exam. Um, a lot of time, if you have pain that kind of starts in the back and then radiates down the buttock into the leg, typically that's coming from the spine. Um, but yeah, I would see somebody because they should be able to work out which one it is. And sometimes patients have symptoms from both. They have overlapping symptoms from both and they have pathology in both the back and the hip. So that can sometimes be tricky to, to work out and figure out where it's coming from. Okay, next question. I have osteoarthritis in the knees and osteoporosis in my legs. One doc told me to avoid squatting and stomping. He said he recommended a replacement and no more steroid shots. Another doctor said he, he could keep giving shots for pain and that stomping and squatting, okay, was okay. So if you have a lot of arthritis behind the kneecap, if that's what the other doctor was referring to, that's probably, probably why he recommended against repeat squatting because once you flex your knee past 90, say you go into a deep squat, then there's increased loads and pressure on the undersurface of your kneecap. So that can cause increased pain. It can cause that increased uh, patellofemoral pain that we talked about. So that may be why he recommended um, avoiding squatting. In terms of steroids, so we usually recommend no more than three to four a year, depending on the degree of arthritis. I don't typically, if you, if you want to avoid surgery, I typically would say that that's okay. I'm happy. You can keep getting them. I don't let you, I make you wait three to four months for a next, an, another one, but um, only you can decide if you're ready for a knee replacement. Um, and, and that's completely your decision. And it depends on how badly your pain affects your quality of life. But we do know that um, repeat cortisone injections over time can have a um, degrading effect to the soft tissue structures in the knee, the cartilage, the meniscus. So that's why I would only recommend repeat cortisone injections in, in a person who already has arthritis. So I'm not going to do more damage to their, you know, cartilage or um, meniscus. I hope that answered your question. Um, ever since I was in my twenties, whenever I sit too long, there's a large swelling behind my knee that seems fluid filled. Um, no change now, 80. What would that be? So if you're think if you're talking way behind your knee, like you can almost feel it, that's probably a Baker's cyst. Um, and those have a tendency to increase and decrease in size. So what happens is you get a tear in the back of the knee between the meniscus and the capsule, and then fluid, joint fluid from in the knee can travel back into this cyst and it can fluctuate in size. And sometimes it's just a one-way valve. So it, the, the cyst just keeps getting bigger. Um, that, so I'm, I'm guessing that's what you probably have. If it's, if it's indeed in the very back of your knee, it's probably a Baker cyst. Sometimes you can get them drained. Um, the problem is, is oftentimes they're near your, your big artery and nerve back there. So a lot of times we try to avoid draining them if you can, but I think that that's probably what you may be talking about. So there's just one comment that says pain in the side of the knee relieved with a cortisone injection. I'm not, um, Sure, if you mean on the joint line or the IT band, it's hard to say. Um, 
But if you have pain over the lateral joint line, uh, a cortisone injection may help if it's from your meniscus or meniscus tear, or you have a little arthritis there, a cortisone injection may help. Okay, I had a partial hip replacement and a kid kidney transplant. Now my left leg is in pain in different muscles and I sometimes have patellar pain, so pain in the front of the knee. I'm 69. I suspect I overused my left leg when I was healing from the kidney transplant. I had PT after hip surgery but have not kept up with the exercises. I currently use a rollator or cane for stability to ease the pain. Can only take Tylenol. So. So yeah, I, I think if, um, it depends. So if you did better with the PT um, after hip surgery, but then haven't been doing it much since then, I, I think another round of physical therapy may benefit you. Um, we oftentimes see people go to PT, they get better and then they stop doing their exercises at home and then the pain returns. So that, that may be what's going on with you. So I would definitely um, meet with your surgeon um, who operated on you and let them know what's going on and that you may want to consider another round of physical therapy. All right. Any other last minute questions? All right, everybody. Well, thank you for joining us. It was a lot of fun. I hope you enjoyed and I hope uh, you have a good rest of your evening. If you have any, um, if you would like to call the clinic, um, I do have a athletic trainer, Erica Baptiste, I work too. If you have any sports related questions, you can always call her. Um, and then of course you can always uh, call the clinic and um, speak with uh, our staff if you need to be seen. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great evening.